In the debate of creation versus evolution, everyone is familiar with the Darwinian idea that human beings evolved from apes. Everyone is familiar with the depiction of the alleged gradual progression from primate through various stages of proto-humans to modern man. And for creationists, we understand that this Darwinian concept is absolutely at odds with the position of intelligent design and divinely created nature. We don't try to reconcile the Darwinian concept of human beings with, say, the Genesis account of creation. We don't try to harmonize the belief that we as humans were created in the image of God from the dust of the earth with the belief that humans evolved from primates. We understand that if the biblical account of history is indeed true, then there was no such thing as, quote, cavemen, no so-called Neanderthals or Cro-Magnon men. We easily appreciate that these two paradigms are at odds with each other, that they are quite irreconcilable. We don't accept the definition of humanity as essentially being upright, hairless apes. And we certainly would never take that Darwinian definition and somehow try to argue that it actually served to prove the Bible rather than evolution. That wouldn't even make any sense whatsoever. However, when it comes to the realm of cosmology, to the questions of the universe, and astronomy and physics, suddenly modern day creationism takes on a very schizophrenic personality indeed. One of the arguments against the idea of the Big Bang that has been made by creationists for decades now is an appeal to the law of entropy, and on its face it sounds like a fairly logical argument. Evolutionary thinking is applied to most areas of science. The field of evolutionary cosmology proposes that the universe is the result of a random explosion some 15 to 18 billion years ago. There are no examples that I've ever seen where an explosion produced an increase in order. Explosions are destructive. They cause spontaneous degeneration, not spontaneous generation. Scientists recognize that all known explosions decrease order and structure and increase chaos. The idea that the cosmos evolved also violates the second law of thermodynamics known as entropy. The second law states that as time advances, the universe becomes less ordered. Over time, all systems left on their own proceed in a direction from order to disorder. All of us witness entropy every day as we see things age and deteriorate. This breakdown of structure directly contradicts the theory of evolution. Now, the second law allows you to increase in order, like a baby growing into adulthood or seed into a tree, but if and only if you have an outside energy source and a harnessing mechanism to capture that energy. Evolutionists don't have that. As Sagan said, the cosmos is all there is. There ain't no more. There is no outside energy source. So the second law is absolutely contradictory to the Big Bang Theory. What we see in cosmology is this. Everything we see, things are running down. Stars are burning up their fuel. Once in a while, a star will explode and goes from order to disorder very quickly. But the only thing we see in the universe today is the universe is running down. It's deteriorating. It's going from order to disorder. It's going to less and less organization. There is an observation that scientists make in every field of science. And it's generally called the laws of entropy. It's as if the universe was wound up somehow and is winding down. Scientists that study cosmology uh, talk about the ultimate heat death of the universe. Conceptually, it's quite clear from what we know that the universe ultimately sometime, billions of years from now, everything will become of uniform temperatures. There'll be no difference in temperature to exploit to get useful work. That the universe had to be designed and ordered in the finite past has not escaped the attention of secular scientists. NASA scientist Robert Jastrow wrote, 
The second law of thermodynamics applied to the cosmos indicates the universe is running down like a clock. If it is running down, there must have been a time when it was fully wound up. The next obvious question is, who wound it up? Gordon Van Wylen addressed the question squarely in his book, Thermodynamics, when he wrote, the author has found that the second law tends to increase his conviction that there is a creator who has the answer for the future destiny of man and the universe. We only see destruction, we never see innovation. And this, I think, is what the creationist model has been proposing all along, that in the beginning things were very good, they were perfect, just like God wanted. But then, as sin entered into the, to the universe and God's curse on all of creation because of that sin, the wages of sin is death, not only in the physical life, but in the universe, everything is dying. The, the sun is burning out, the moon's orbit is decaying. Everything is in this process of death and decay. Now, the peculiar thing about this kind of argument and really this entire approach to creationist cosmology is that in the end, the creationists are still falling back on the definition and explanation of what a star even is that was provided by the evolutionary cosmologists in the first place. Conventional creationism still accepts the notion that the universe is an unfathomably vast place full of galaxies, nebulas, cosmic gases, comets, asteroids, planetary bodies, and of course, the entire family of stars. And on a surface level, it seems to make sense to argue that the stars are essentially, quote, burning out, and thus displaying evidence of the law of entropy and action, which itself might suggest that indeed the universe is like some giant clock that was wound up back at the beginning by some unmoved mover. But is that really how stars work? according to modern astronomy. Are they really just slowly burning out, like a campfire that eventually consumes all the wood? Or is that analogy not really in alignment with the model of what a star is and what they are doing, which everyone, including creationists, are claiming to accept as scientific truth? Well, way out there in space, there's huge clouds of dust and gas. And if one of those clouds of dust and gas is massive enough, its own gravity causes it to start to collapse. So it falls in on itself, and towards the center of that cloud, it gets denser and denser, it gets hotter and hotter. And eventually, the particles that the, that the gas and the dust are made of are brought so close together that they start to stick together, they start to fuse. That's the energy source of a star. The star switches on and begins to shine. Inside every newborn star, Hydrogen atoms are fused together to make helium. This process is called fusion, and it creates the energy that powers every star. What happens to a star during the rest of its life depends on how massive it is at its birth. A star like the Sun is in a delicate balance between gravity, which wants to make the star collapse in on itself, and the pressure that pushes outwards that comes from the energy that's been produced in these fusion reactions happening at its core. However, at some point in the future, the hydrogen runs out. And at that point, the core of the star will start to collapse in on itself under its own weight. It gets denser, it gets hotter, until a point where you can actually start to use the helium atoms themselves as the fuel for the fusion, pushing helium atoms together and making carbon and oxygen the next heavier elements in the periodic table. As the star begins to fuse helium, it creates more energy and that causes the outer layers of the star to expand. One day, our sun will grow so large it will swallow up the inner planets of the solar system, out as far as the Earth. It will become a red giant. For the sun, this will be the beginning of the end. What happens is that the outer layers of the star get farther and farther from the middle. The force of gravity that they feel is getting weaker and weaker. And actually, the star loses hold of its outer atmosphere. Its outer atmosphere drifts off out into space. It expands out to become a planetary nebula. And they're some of the most beautiful objects in the universe. Once the outer layers have drifted away, all that is left of the star is its core. A white dwarf star is the dead remnant core of a star like the sun at the end of its life. 
what's left behind is something that might weigh as much as half the mass of the sun, but it's only about the size of the Earth. So it's an incredibly dense object, it's dead, there's no nuclear fusion going on it anymore, it's incredibly hot, but then over millions of years it will gradually cool down to become a black dwarf. Some stars, however, are much more massive than the sun, and they lead very different lives. They are able to fuse heavier and heavier elements inside their core. The star gets bigger and bigger. Some grow up to a thousand times the size of our sun until it has fused elements all the way up to iron. And once we've formed an iron core, there's no more energy can be got from fusion. That core collapses. The rest of the star starts to collapse in after it, but then it bounces off. There's a huge shock wave, and in just a second, bang, the outer parts of the star are blasted off into space in a huge supernova explosion. Now, this really is quite curious because ultimately it puts the modern creationist in the position of having to defend the alleged scientific facts about stars being giant nuclear explosions, where hydrogen is constantly being converted into helium and giving off excess energy in the process, while at the same time trying to explain why this is not an example of gradual change, but instead evidence of intelligent design in a very young universe. We can find a number of different attempts to reconcile the idea that stars are indeed massive balls of gas in the midst of the process of nucleosynthesis with the claim that they are but a few thousand years old. Some creationists say that the amount of neutrinos being expelled by our sun isn't nearly as many as there should be. Others talk about the rotation of the sun being too slow according to the models of evolutionary cosmology. Others still will argue that if the sun had really evolved over millions of years, it would have went through something called a T Tauri phase, at which time it would have produced extreme solar winds that would have pushed all the gases out of the solar system entirely, and this would have prevented the formation of all the gaseous planets we supposedly know exist right now. So in the end, it really just turns into the strange exercise of listening to different people with PhDs appeal to speculative models of physics and astronomy, trying to poke a hole in one side's theoretical construct by pointing to a different theoretical construct. It's the modern day equivalent of a massive argument over how many angels dance on the head of a pin, only now with much bigger egos involved and a lot more math and both sides actually believe that their arguments are being backed up with true, solid, scientific data. And this is the whole point. The whole silly affair is honestly no different than if creationists were putting themselves in the position of trying to defend the quote-unquote data of fossils and bone fragments claimed to be the true missing links between our humans and our primate ancestors, but then try to argue that no, this doesn't mean that humans actually evolved from apes, it just means that God must have created this whole entire spectrum of primate to humanoid creatures all at the same time, a few thousand years ago. Nobody would do that. Nobody would try to take a model and a definition that is clearly in complete opposition to the Genesis account and come up with some convoluted argument as to why it actually fit with creationism using their own fake fossils and their own pseudoscientific thinking. Yet this is precisely what creationism has been doing, as we have just blindly accepted the idea that stars are indeed giant balls of gas, being crushed by gravity to the point that nuclear fusion turns hydrogen into helium, and then helium into even heavier elements. Because if that was really occurring, that by definition is evolution occurring on an atomic level, just as the cosmic evolutionists claim all the elements in the universe were created. 